Did you hit her? I hit her. Punched her in the face. Warning, some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Jordy Hudson was a 45-year-old artist who loved to be alone and create art. She was an excellent painter, but sometimes she couldn't be herself due to having a condition she had been dealing with for over 14 years. The condition was meningitis. Meningitis is an inflammation and swelling of the protective membranes covering the brain and the spinal cord. Due to that problem, she loves being alone, painting, and creating art. Leading up to April 8, 2016, Jordy was doing better with her condition. She was able to be happier than ever, so she decided, hey, why not treat myself and go out for the night? Jordy and her mom were best friends. She told her mother everything. Even though they didn't live together, she and Jordy would talk almost daily. On that night, she called her mom as she would typically do any other day and said, hey, I'm going out around town to have some fun, just hanging out, nothing special. Her mother responds, okay, Jordy, I love you, and please be safe out there. She also said, call me tomorrow before coming over for lunch. Jordy said, okay, and they both hung up. The following day, April 9, 2016, Jordy's mom was expecting to hear from her daughter, but she still hadn't received her phone call. So she decided to call Jordy, and the phone just rang and rang with no answer. She was confused because she and Jordy were going to meet for lunch and talk about how her night around town was, just spending some mother and daughter time. Not hearing from her daughter, she started to get worried. She decided to drive over to Jordy because she didn't live far from her. She was hoping that she would see Jordy outside of her house cleaning. When she arrived at Jordy's house, she walked up, rang the doorbell, knocked on the door, and nothing. No answer, she tried to look through the window to see if she could see Jordy or anything happening in her house. Without seeing a sight from Jordy, she decided to go home and hoped Jordy would call her back since they had plans to go out for lunch that day. After three days of not hearing from her daughter Jordy, she had a very sick and worried feeling about Jordy. So she called the St. Augustine police and asked to do a welfare check on her daughter Jordy. Dispatch sent a team of detectives over to Jordy's house to see if she was there. Arriving at her house and knocking on the door, they had no response. They walked over to her yard to see nothing and no one. But when walking back to the front of the house, a weird guy walks up to the detectives, and without them saying a word, he asks the detectives, are you looking for Jordy? The detectives were thrown off since they were there for a simple welfare check, but the way he was talking and asking about what the detectives were doing and if they found out anything had detectives feel worried for Jordy since they hadn't seen her and no one was answering the door. Before leaving, the detectives asked him what was his name and he responded with my name is Fred. They asked Fred when was the last time he saw Jordy and he told detectives he last saw Jordy on the weekend when they saw each other at the Giggling Gator Pub. The Giggling Gator Pub is a local bar people would go to get some drinks and hang out. Fred said Jordy asked to meet up there to have some drinks and relax. Detectives asked Fred what time did he meet with Jordy at the bar, and he told them around 1.30, and he left the bar around 2.15 a.m. They asked Fred what was Jordy wearing the night of the disappearance. Fred said she wore a white shirt with a scarf and had glasses on, just regular clothes, nothing crazy or fancy. Since detectives had nothing on Fred, they gave him their card and told him to give them a call if he saw or heard anything from Jordy or about Jordy. On the way back to headquarters, the detectives get a crazy call from dispatch about a caller stating he thinks there is a crime scene outside of his house and he needed help. Sounds good, please, Farmer. I'm front of my house at 88 Cedar Street. Can you send an officer over here? It looks like somebody got injured out there last night. Arriving at the caller's house, the detectives walk up to what they believe was a routine call to see a giant bamboo stick full of blood. Detectives also see a trail of blood leading them toward the back of the caller's house. Following the path of blood, detectives see blood splatter on the picket fences. As detectives reach the picket border on the ground along the wall, they find a kitchen knife full of blood. Besides the kitchen knife, detectives find a pair of glasses. The glasses seem to be the same kind of glasses Fred described Jordy wearing when they were last together. After securing the crime scene and collecting the evidence, the detectives had no clue what to think. They still had no information about Jordy. They now had a bloody crime scene without a body. Detectives drove to the pub, where Fred said he and Jordy got drinks and hung out. 
Arriving at Giggling Gator, Detective asked if they could look at the cameras for the night of April 9th. When looking over the footage, you can see Jordy walk into the pub alone and sit at the bar in the front. After seeing her get a drink, you can see what looks like Fred walking into the picture, and Jordy gets up and hugs him. After chatting for a few, you can see Fred showing Jordy something on his phone that seems to upset her, and she indeed looks bothered by it. Jordy's body language changed. After that, it wasn't the same. She waves Fred off like to leave and go away. And he does. Fred walks off as if nothing happened. Now they bring Fred to the station for a few questions. Detectives want to ask him about that night since they saw the footage of Fred and Jordy at the Giggling Gator. Detectives want to find out what they were talking about and what he showed Jordy on his phone that made her upset and ended their night. Fred sat down at the table and told the investigators that he and Jordy just hung out like friends and nothing more. Fred said Jordy paid for all the drinks and he wasn't sure if she was drunk, but after a few drinks things went downhill. Fred and Jordy were neighbors and she was mad that Fred didn't do the correct repairs on the building. Fred showed her a few pictures of damage he felt he couldn't repair. Fred said she got upset about his response to her and he just walked off because he didn't want to ruin a friendship. Detectives go back to look at the footage from the Giggling Gator, and when looking at the footage of the front door, you can see Fred walking out and leaving the bar. On the footage, after Fred left the bar, detectives kept watch, and around 2.30, you can see Jordy asking the bartender a question. At the same time, you can see a group gathering in front of the bar. One male has a shaved head and a lot of tattoos standing around six feet tall. You also can see another male backing up like he doesn't want to fight as the tattooed male keeps walking toward him. After that guy runs away, the group returns to the front of the bar to smoke a cigarette. It is 2.45 on the cams and you see everyone hanging out and slowly creeping into the frame. Is Jordy. Jordy left the bar out of a different exit and she wasn't shy. So she just walked up to the tall tattoo guy and just start having a full conversation. Jordy was in the bar when this crazy dude was outside having an outburst, so she didn't know he was a hothead. After talking to Jordy for about 10 minutes, the group starts walking toward the back of the bar out of sight. That was the last time Jordy was seen on the bar cams. Detectives don't know if Jordy had any connection to the two guys or if she just met them that night. The only thing detectives have right now is that Jordy and her new friends are walking in the same direction of the crime scene where they found the bloody knife and the broken glasses. After a few days with no information, detectives get good luck when they get the camera footage from the unknown crime scene. In that footage, around 3.32, at night two outlines come into play at the top of the street, walking down towards the crime scene. You see two outlines, a taller figure, and the other outline is a small and shorter figure. When they get under the streetlight, you can see that it is Jordy with the tall tattooed man from the bar. Jordy and the taller guy walk over to where the knife and broken glasses were found, the exact location of the unknown crime scene. As a car drives by, you can see what looks like a guy with what looked like a limp body, but you really can't make out what is going on. You can see what looks like someone throwing something, but you can only think it's the guy harming Jordy somehow. After tossing what looks like a body into the bushes, he walks off like nothing ever happened. After watching more of the footage, it's now 6.30, and you see a car slowly turn and drive down the street and stop right at the same spot that Jordy and the tattoo man were earlier in the night. The car turns their lights off, and two people get out. The taller guy and a lady get out of the vehicle. They walk over to the same spot where he threw the body into the bushes. Both can be seen moving around, opening the back door to the car, and closing it fast. After that, they both jump in the car and leave, maybe thinking they are in the clear but not knowing the bloody knife, and the broken glasses were still at the crime scene. A witness came out a few days after Jordy was reported missing, and they told detectives they saw Jordy outside the bar with two guys. They did know the name of the smaller guy, but they didn't know who the taller dude was. Detectives found out the name of the smaller guy was Raymond Hecht. After bringing him in and asking Raymond a few questions, he said he had never met Jordy before that night. He and his friend were outside hanging out, and when they wanted to leave, Jordy said she could give them a ride home, and they were more than happy to get a ride home after drinking and hanging out for the night. Detectives asked Raymond for his friend's name, and he said his name was Harry Branson. 
They find out the car seen on footage was a blue Versa and it belonged to Judith Branson, which was Harry's mom. He was using his mother's car to commit a crime. They also found out the lady in the footage was Christine Thomas and she was Harry's girlfriend. Christine Thomas played dumb when detectives picked her up and brought her down for questioning. What is going on? I, I really don't understand. Here's your opportunity right now, right in the beginning. <laughs> Do it for yourself. To help yourself out and be truthful and honest with us. I don't know what in the hell y'all are talking about. But that changed fast when they showed her the video of her helping Harry do something to Jordy's body. At that moment, she no longer wanted to play dumb. She told them everything about that night. Do you? Okay. He wanted to go back, see if she was alive, dead. Who's dead? I don't know until I saw the, um, all the blood coming down from her neck. She said Harry called her and said he needed help. His friend was hurt. He never told her the truth. She told detectives when they got to the crime scene, Harry told her get out so he can put his friend in the back seat. But when they walked up, she saw a female on the ground with tons of blood everywhere. She also told them what Harry did with the body. She told the detectives that Jordy's body was buried outside of Harry's mother's house under a fire pit. After hearing that, they got a warrant for Harry's mother's house. It was true they would find Jordy's body under the fire pit at her house and finding Harry not far from his mother, house officers picked him up and took him down for questioning. The fire pit right over there. Okay. It's under the fire pit. When asking Harry and confronting him with the footage of his girlfriend's confessions, Harry was caught off guard but confessed. Well, what happened? Y'all left the giggling gator and then what? The girl said something about giving me a ride get me out of there. Said something, I don't even know what really what she had said, but I snapped, I completely lost it, and I don't know why or how. Okay. Did you hit her? I hit her, I punched her in the face. Where'd you get the knife from? She had the knife. She had the knife? She had the knife. I grabbed her and shoved her hands towards her, so. Okay. Did you feel it go in? Yes. I was standing there covered in blood. He had to return and get rid of her body, so he went to his mother's house, got the key to her car, picked up his girlfriend, and drove to the crime scene. He got out with her and took Jordy's body into the back seat. They went to his mother's house, where he buried her body near the fire pit where the detectives found her. Harry pled guilty to second degree murder and got 40 years. His girlfriend was given eight years for her part in the crime.